like to welcome you to this the 1982 Institute on World Affairs. This is the first uh, major segment of this institute. Uh, I have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, film originally scheduled for Thursday, entitled I'm from Palestine, will instead be shown on Monday at noon. Uh, tomorrow's speakers will include uh, a professor of environmental chemistry, Dr. Khalil Mansi, who is an expert on world uh, water resources, will be speaking in the, pion in the Pioneer Room tomorrow at 3 p.m. Um, tomorrow night, Dr. Eric Thorbeck, who is a professor of economics and food economics at Cornell University, will give a, a lecture on world development dependence versus interdependence. I'd like to say a few words about this year's institute. Uh, since World War II, we've tended to think the world is divided up into three sections. Uh, the first world consisting of the United States and the developed countries which ally with it. The second world consisting of the Soviet Union and the satellites which ally with it. And the third world which consists of all countries which do, are not included in the first and second world. Given the wide variety of cultures and people which inhabit this third world, now, we have come to the realization that this third world can be thought of as being actually several worlds in one, given the different geographical regions and so forth. What all these countries have in common is that they are less developed than the countries which lie to the north of them, the first and third world. Thus, you have the idea of north-south. A north-south dialogue uh, concentrates on the gap, politically and economically, between the first, second, and third world. The north, consisting of the first and second world, and the south, the third world. Uh, it functions with the uh, relationships, dynamic relationships, between the north and the south. And as much as anything, uh, focuses on a uh, tolerance for cultures, people, attitudes, and beliefs that are different than our own. Tonight's speaker comes to us from Princeton University, where he is a professor of international law there. He is the acting director of the, the Center for International Studies. Uh, he, is graduate, he graduated in the 50s uh, from University of Pennsylvania with a bachelor's degree in economics. He attended Yale, Yale Law School and received his jurisprudence from Harvard. Uh, he has traveled widely through, throughout the world. He was involved in Iran uh, during the hostage crisis was over there talking to some of the leaders at the time. Uh, he has spent time in Vietnam during the 1960s, and he has written extensively on the subject of international law and affecting the global order. Uh, he is obviously very active politically, and with that, I'll introduce to you the keynote speaker for the 1982 Institute on World Affairs, Dr. Richard Falk. Let me say first, <clears throat> first of all that it's a, a great honor for me to participate in this uh, conference. It is also, I think, very important that a conference of this sort uh, be held here in Iowa. I think it's very likely that if American understanding is to increase about these problems of the relationship between Western civilization and the United States, 
and the rest of the world, that understanding is going to have to take root in what can accurately be called the heartland of America. Adlai Stevenson once said that the item of technology that most Americans need and don't realize they need is a hearing aid. <laughs> and by that he didn't mean hearing so much the person one's in a conversation with as hearing the rest of the world. One of the great costs, I think, of being very powerful, so powerful that wherever Americans go, wherever a conference is held now in the world, everyone has to speak English, that we've forgotten to listen. We need to listen to what others are saying. And that's not very easy for the powerful. The powerful and the rich have never been good at listening. And one of the reasons civilizations fall is that hearing deficiency, a cultural hearing deficiency, very much associated, I think, with having too much power. It's also making everyone else speak English is an important illustration of a kind of cultural underdevelopment that arises. Fewer and fewer Americans need to speak in the languages of other peoples, and therefore we become less adept at communicating in the most effective ways with other societies, even though we're involved in societies all over the world. Just so that I seem ideologically impartial, let me make the same point from the perspective of the Soviet Union. One of the things that Stalin did after World War II to imprint uh, the Soviet presence uh, in the countries of Eastern Europe was to construct these incredibly ugly, massive Ministry of Culture uh, buildings in all the European cities, and they were always the biggest uh, building for obvious reasons of projecting the sense of power and uh, domination. And this uh, generated a joke in, Ma in Warsaw, which was as follows. One person asks another, where do you ha get the best view of Warsaw? From the top of the Ministry of Culture, of course, was the reply. The first person asked, well, why do you say that? Well, that's the only place in Warsaw you can see the Ministry of Culture from. Now, the relevance to my theme is that we are in a sense, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, we're the Ministry of Culture. See, and again, that's a very hard thing, I think, for Americans to really absorb and think about. What does it mean to be the Ministry of Culture for the rest of the world? And we can't see it because we're on top of it. See, it's not available to us in a way. And it contributes to a certain sense of complacency and indifference about the rest of the world precisely because of that kind of circumstance. Of course, Ronald Reagan thinks that all you have to do to understand the rest of the world and to get along with it is to learn to, for them to learn how to tango, which is a kind of limited image of international politics and I don't think one that has too much future, at least I hope it doesn't, despite the tango being a rather nice, though tragic dance. 
A lot of what I want to emphasize in these remarks tonight is expressed by, the, by a statement made by the great Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy. And I think goes to the heart of the North-South relationship. Tolstoy said, I sit on a man's back choking him and making him carry me and yet assure myself and others that I am sorry for him and wish to lighten his load by all possible means except by getting off his back. Now in many ways it seems to me this expresses two sides of the North-South relationship. The one side is despite the success of the movement for national independence, despite the fact that the upheaval against colonialism may be the most important change of the century in terms of the character of world political system. Despite this, it is still, I think, accurate to say that the white northern countries dominate and in many ways exploit the rest of the world. and that this structure of dominance and exploitation is the most basic form of the North-South relationship, despite the accuracy of what Chris Rice has said in his opening remarks about the diversity that exists in the South, where, of course, one has some of the very richest countries now in terms of uh, financial uh, stature as consequence of uh, oil revenues. The other side of this North-South relationship is the conviction in the North of a benevolent intention. Whether that benevolence is expressed by the idea that we are delivering souls to Christianity as it was in the era of discovery and the establishment of the colonial system, or whether it's a matter of delivering bodies and machines to the process of modernization as it has been in the more recent decades. There is an image that the North or the West, Western civilization, is the bearer of a higher order, higher values, that it is basically altruistic, that it has, on balance, contributed to the well-being of the South, and that it is a source of greater strength uh, for the countries of the South. Now, these two ideas, or these two realities, are part of what I think make it extremely confusing often to engage in a dialogue across these cultural, geographical, and developmental boundaries. And this confusion of exploitation on the one side and benevolence on the other side simultaneously 
present goes way back in the history of North-South relations to the very beginning of the era of discovery and in some ways was most vividly expressed by the encounter between the great explorers and the indigenous peoples of this uh, Western Hemisphere. When Christopher Columbus encountered the first human beings in the West Indies, the Arawak Indians, he wrote to his sponsors in Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, that they were, in his words, so gentle, so ignorant of the arts of war, that when he showed them swords, they took them by the edges and so spilled their first drops of bright blood against Western steel. He added, they are so affectionate and have so little greed and are in all ways so amenable, I assure your highnesses there is, in my opinion, no better people and no better land in the world. They love their neighbors as themselves. Their way of speaking is the sweetest in the world. And then he goes on to the other part of the reality. They should be good servants and very intelligent for I have observed that they soon repeat anything that is said to them, and I believe they would easily be made Christians, for they appeared to me to have no religion. Columbus ends up suggesting to the Spanish crown, and I quote, a steady traffic in slaves be instituted so to help defray the costs of colonization. And he would end up bringing back from his third voyage 1,500 of these Indians as captives. And you see that in that set of perceptions, which is really more, I suppose, one of the Indians discovering Columbus than the other way around, one has all the elements of the North-South relationship, including, it seems to me, the acknowledgement of extraordinary cultural dignity and achievement, while at the same time putting forth a justification for destroying that which is acknowledged. Instead of learning from what in many ways, from certainly from an ethical and spiritual perspective, would seem like a superior civilization, the immediate response was one of appropriation, one of seeing the property value of these individuals who were other, they represented something other, and as something other, they rendered themselves susceptible uh, to not only colonization and to forced conversion to Christianity, but to becoming literal slaves, to being taken as captives. And what is so profound, I think, about this interaction is the degree to which it is hidden from the perpetrator as something natural and benevolent. Now, alongside that kind of perception, one has something else that constitutes the benevolent intention, 
and has recently, I suppose, been best embodied in the report on North-South relations of the Brunt Commission issued two, three years ago, which brought together a series of distinguished statesmen who, in effect, uh, set forth their view of how to create a much more desirable set of North-South relations. Willy Brandt, the former chancellor of West Germany, in the introduction to this report writes, we see a world in which poverty and hunger still prevail in many huge regions, in which resources are squandered without consideration of their renewal, in which more armaments are made and sold than ever before and where a destructive capacity has been accumulated to blow up our planet several times over. He goes on, there is no reasonable alternative to a policy of reducing tensions and bringing about a higher degree of cooperation. There is much in favor of a program of survival with common and unifying objectives. We must aim at a global community based on contract rather than status, on consensus rather than compulsion. Now the trouble with this view in my judgment is that it's pure piety and exhortation. There is no politics connected with people of goodwill however high their own status, telling the West or telling the North what it should do for the South. It's, it calms the conscience, but it doesn't change the patterns of behavior or the type of relationship. And it's not accidental, it seems to me, that all the things that the Brandt Commission deplored have gotten worse since the issuance of the report, and all the specific recommendations that were set forth, and they are certainly everybody's inventory of what the sensible person of Sunday school disposition would do, all those things have, been, have gone unheeded. Because good intentions do not produce good deeds in the domain of politics. And that again seems to me to be something that the powerful are very reluctant to learn. Because they like to say that having projecting images of generosity and altruism, the reformist spirit, is somehow reconcilable with their positions of privilege and power. And it may ease the conscience of the North and the West, but it doesn't contribute to the alleviation of the scandals of poverty and mass misery uh, that are the fate of the South. And an interesting embodiment of this gap between the pieties of language or rhetoric and the cruelties of deeds are illustrated, it seems to me, in the career of Robert McNamara, who served as the head of the World Bank and expressed very eloquently uh, the Brunt view of the world. And yet careful studies are now beginning to show that where the World Bank was active, for instance, there's a recent book on the role of the World Bank in the Philippines, which was one of its principal areas of activity in the South. 
that it had three main effects, that it strengthened repression by the state, that it increased the levels of foreign economic exploitation, and that it's the kinds of projects it encouraged and the kinds of development plans that it fostered had the result of worsening the relative internal position of peasants, workers, and even the national bourgeoisie or middle class. That is, McNamara brought to the Philippines by way of benevolent intention the same results he had attempted to achieve in Vietnam as Secretary of Defense by means of military intervention. Now that's a hard way of putting things and perhaps a provocative way. But I think if you look carefully at the real effect of this kind of benevolence that is so influential now in reshaping the way in which third world countries develop that one will see that we have to rethink what it means to exercise a positive influence uh, in the South. Let me add to this critique of the reformist view of things an observation that the South by itself has a lot of problems that are not of the North's making. And if the North were to disappear from the planet, there would still be very severe economic, cultural, and political dilemmas in most third world countries. And these dilemmas in some ways I think are created of course by a past that was heavily influenced and shaped in many cases by Western domination, but it also has to do with the interplay between the very severe problems of matching resources to population in many countries in the South. It has to do with an inherited internal structure that is very exploitative and corrupt in many Southern countries. And it has to do with a traditional culture uh, that may be very harsh. I think the situation or the recent experience of Iran suggests more vividly than any other, or as vividly as any other country, the dilemma that faces uh, countries of the South. Because Iran illustrates in its two recent political embodiments the problems that face countries in the South. Under the Shah, between 1953 and 1978, Iran probably more vigorously than any third world country pursued modernization in a Western style. The Shah had credible dreams of becoming the new Cyrus and founding an empire that would be modern and yet provide Iran with 
increasing stature in the world. While this process was going on, as is now painfully evident, this type of modernization, even though it resulted in very impressive annual increments in gross national product, and the, all the numbers look good, the only problem was it alienated almost 100% of the people living in Iran alienated them to such a degree that unlike any other revolution that I know anything about, even those that were beneficiaries of the Shah's regime refused to fight for it. The Iranian revolution, without any assistance from outside, overthrew one of the most militarized governing elites in the entire world. And it did it in a setting in which all classes, all regions collaborated against the established order. And the wider message of the Iranian Revolution is that people in the third world want something more than modernization, westernization, even material prosperity. Yet what has come since the Shah is certainly not encouraging either because it suggests the degree of bloody war with, it, it's not quite fair to say it's let it in, but it's persisted in a very bloody war uh, with Iraq. And it has shown almost no capacity to create a new form of social and economic development that allows for the rebuilding of the society along new lines. Its repudiation of the West has been so total as to leave a virtual institutional vacuum in its place. An African writer, Yambo Olagum, in a very fine book called Bound to Violence, wrote, in his alienation to be sure, Raymond Spartacus Kasumi's found an open door to revolt. For him and his Africa, it was, in a sense, a duty to be revolutionary. But how? See, that but how, once the colonial masters have gone, is an exceedingly difficult question, particularly to the degree that the world system is shaped by very alien and alienating forces associated with capitalism and associated with great powers, not only the United States, but some of the European powers and certainly the Soviet Union as well. And for the third world, there is a emerging mood of despair that arises partly because modernization Western style has proved to be culturally impoverishing and has not led to the solution, except in countries that have enormous resources at their disposal, has not led to the solution of problems of poverty at all. 
The problems of state socialism as a model have also been very pronounced. It has had very great difficult, socialist societies have had very great difficulty relating to the world economy because they do not fit into it naturally and they are often discriminated against by the principal economic forces in the world. Besides, the state socialist countries have shown very little ability to separate socialism as a way of organizing the, the economic life of the society and the maintenance of cultural and political freedom. No third world society has been very successful in reconciling a socialist economic program with the maintenance of human rights and political freedoms. And finally, the model of traditionalism associated with Khomeini to a very pure extent, but to some lesser degree with uh, other third world leaders, has also proved to be very unsatisfying in terms of the relations of state to society and it as a path, as an alternative path uh, to development. Therefore, I think that in thinking about the North-South dialogue, it is exceedingly important to acknowledge how difficult it has seemed to be for the countries of the South to use their independence in a creative and effective way. Now there is a third general element of the situation that I think is important to take into account and that confuses our capacity to understand the whole set of relationships bound up in the North-South dialogue. Our every civilization develops its own form of idolatry. That is its own form of making statements about reality that are intended to enslave rather than to liberate. Our form of idolatry is an excessive trust in numbers, in economists, in computers, and in the general apparatus and mechanism of the state. And it is, it seems to me, a barrier of very considerable magnitude to true, un truer understanding, which has to do, it seems to me, with changing attitudes, beliefs, values, and institutions, not in manipulating uh, numbers, not in entrusting the state with the solution of the most fundamental human problems. One of the things that these, these forms of idolatry lead to is abstractions in the domain of geopolitics. Not the suffering of the child, 
but the abstract doctrines of the leaders. And those abstractions are often used as justifications for introducing force into the relations of the North and the South. Currently, I suppose, the best illustration from an American point of view are the justifications put forward for a very bloody path of intervention in Central America. President Reagan has said, and I quote, a new kind of colonialism stalks the world today and threatens our independence. It is brutal and totalitarian it is not of our hemisphere, but it threatens our hemisphere. A determined propaganda campaign is sought to mislead as to the true nature of the conflict in El Salvador. Very simply, guerrillas armed and supported by and through Cuba are attempting to impose a Marxist-Leninist dictatorship on the people of El Salvador as part of a larger imperialistic plan. And the main policymaker for the government, uh, Thomas Enders of the State Department, formerly ambassador in Cambodia, adds, and I quote him, there is something else if after Nicaragua, El Salvador is captured by a violent minority. America, what state in Central America will be able to resist? How long would it be before major strategic U.S. interests, the canal, sea lanes, oil supplies, were at risk? These kinds of abstractions, familiar to people who were around in the Vietnam period, about falling dominoes, about making the world safe uh, for democracy, and the like. continue to provide a rationale for trying to smash movements of national liberation and national revolution throughout the third world. They continue to offer militarist elites in Central America and elsewhere American arms, American advisors, comparable doctrines motivate the Kremlin to invade Afghanistan, to interfere in the political destiny of Ethiopia, some other uh, African countries. The same logic underlies calling the effort to destroy the Palestinian movement for national rights, to destroy that movement under the label Peace for the Galilee operation. More important than the North-South dialogue, in other words, is the persisting efforts by the most powerful forces in the North to destroy the most indigenous and spontaneous political movements in the South. The Vietnam War did not end the enterprise of intervention in the Third World, it changed the means of intervention. But it has still made the United States, and now to a degree the Soviet Union, into the enemies of self-determination in the Third World, and therefore into the guarantors of political and social and cultural arrangements 
that do not represent the will of the people living in those particular countries. It is